to our service. And uh, let me begin by reading a uh, call to worship today from John chapter 1. So please listen as I read beginning at verse 1. John the Apostle writes these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not, has not overcome it or has not understood it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that to which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory.
here we go again. Well, okay. We thought we finally had it fixed. We even bought a new part and everything, so we'll see. Well, let's see. Again, welcome. Glad that you are here this morning to worship. Let's take a moment to pray to our God. Oh, God, we thank you. That is, we have sung this morning that we think back to the days of Moses. When Moses asked, God, what is your name? And you said, Yahweh, the Lord Almighty, the God who is always in the present. You're not the God of the past nor the future, but you are the God that is I am. We thank you that you are almighty, that you uh, have no limitations at all. God, we come to you today with so many limitations. We acknowledge that today. We are weak in so many ways. But you, oh God, you are so powerful. There is nothing too difficult for you. You are in all places. You know all things. There is no limitations at all with you. So what a wonderful God that we have. A, a God that we, in our wildest dreams, we could never make up or imagine. And God, thank you that through the Lord Jesus, you have revealed yourself as the word came in human flesh to reveal who you really are and to allow us to have a wonderful relationship and friendship with you, not just in this lifetime, but forever. So God, we come and we truly want to worship you today to give you all the worth, to give you all the praise, to exalt your name and only your name. And we ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. We're going to dismiss the children off to their groups. So all the way up through high school, you can head out to your groups at this time. Appreciate the leaders that are working behind the scenes in the nursery and in preschool and elementary and middle school today. I received a wonderful gift this morning. If you were here last week, this was the sermon title. I'm going to have to come over here. But if you can't see it from way in the back or online here, it says, please excuse me while I change. So it is great. This is a T-shirt. There is a middle, uh, it's a uh, medium, and also a large. So medium is when I'm doing really well and I'm eating my vegetables. <laughs> large for when I'm eating cookies. <laughs> and in both cases, People need to be aware. Please excuse me while I change. So that was the sermon title from last week. So greatly appreciate that uh, wonderful gift that a number of you were involved in uh, this week. So I'm going to switch over to this mic. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's switch gears here. And uh, we're going to uh, begin our um, sermon for today. We're going to have our sermon time. We are going to have a song, and then we're going to switch over to the communion table. And uh, then we will have some announcements and prayer, and that will be the order of service today. So if you haven't picked up a communion cup uh, in the front or the back, please do so. Uh, if you're watching online today, uh, find something that uh, you would be able to use for the bread and for the cup this morning. I've titled the message today, just a little taste. Just a little taste. Now, where do I get that from? That was uh, my grand, one of my grandmother's uh, favorite sayings. And if we were in, um, at the Thanksgiving table, or uh, we've just concluded the Christmas meal, or maybe any family gathering, that uh, when my grandmother was offered dessert, that's when she would say that, J just, just give me a taste. Just give me just a, a little bit, just a small portion. So what that meant was uh, a sliver of pie or uh, a sliver of cake or if there was something, a new recipe, just, just, just give me a taste. Just, just give me a little sample. 
And sometimes, when it comes to food, we, we just want a little sample. It's like, I just, just a little sample, especially if it's something new or something we're not used to. And so it could be ice cream. If you go to an ice cream shop, right, sometimes they'll say, well, would you like to just have a, a taste? And they'll just give you a little sample. Or cheese. They'll, they'll go with toothpicks and they'll just give you a little piece of cheese. Or uh, fudge. If you go to a place and they have fudge, it's like, well, would you like a little sample? Or in a mall food court over the years, uh, always it seemed to be the Japanese restaurant. It's like, well, would you like a sample? Or remember Arby's, would you, would you like a sample in a food court? Years and years ago, when I was much, much younger, I had a group of friends, and we kind of had this running joke, this was way back in the 90s, of uh, trying to, to come up with our million dollar concept that we could become rich. Well, it never happened, but we had all kinds of uh, suggestions. And one of my long list was someday to make a million dollars was to open a cafe or a diner or a restaurant and call it just a little taste. That in this restaurant concept that you could go through and just, you know, those little tiny, uh, I don't know, paper containers and just put a little taste of something in there or just these little plates of pie or whatever. And you could kind of go through and just kind of pick and choose and uh, that was my concept to make a million dollars. And then someone said, well, have you ever been to a really, really, really fancy restaurant? No. They're like, that's kind of what they do there. And I'm like, oh, well, I kind of want to do that for the middle class or whatever. So, but anyway, uh, just a little taste. So today, I just want to give you a little taste, a little sample of our upcoming study and new teaching series. Now, over the last four, almost four years, I've been doing a personal study of this word that is found about 170 times in the New Testament. It's a key word that I never realized was so important. And so today, I would like just to give you a taste, just a sampling of what I have discovered. And then in the next several weeks, and I don't know how many weeks, it'll just be a few weeks, I want us to continue to have a taste, just a little sampling of this amazing concept that is in the Bible. So let's begin in John, John chapter 1. That's where we're going to kind of hang out today. In the passage that uh, we started with, first of all, John chapter 1, verse 1. I read it at the very beginning of the service. This is a, an amazing passage of scripture that gives to us so much information. But John the Apostle was writing to two different groups of people. You may not be aware of that. The first group was to Jewish people. The second, Greek, uh, the second group was to the Greeks. Now, they were very different people. But they had a central concept in both of their thinkings, was this concept of the word. Now for the Jewish people, and, and John begins with that, in the beginning, Genesis 1.1. So for the Jewish people, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God spoke and everything came into existence. That was their concept of the word. There was this word spoken and everything came into existence. For the Greeks, it was very different. They had this concept of word, but it was an impersonal force. There was, they knew that there was something working behind the scenes in our world, in our universe, and they didn't know what it was, and they, but they called it the word. And so John the Apostle picks up on both of those definitions and brings it together when he writes this. In the beginning was the word. So they would both have agreed with that. It's like, yeah, okay. And the word was with God. Now, for the, for the Jewish person, they were like, no. Um, well, all right, continue. This is, this is intriguing. What, what are you talking about? And for the Greeks, and the word was God, they're like, wait a minute. This impersonal force was actually God? Tell, tell me more. And so he continues. 
In verse 2, he, okay, this impersonal force is not uh, impersonal. It, it's, it's, a, it's a person. It's a pronoun. He, he was with God in the beginning. And so for the Jews, for the, for the Greeks, they, they were like, hmm, this, this is new information. Because John is introducing to them Jesus and the relationship that Jesus has with God. And, and he's doing all of that. And so he's starting right where they are. And then verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing has been made that has been made. Uh, that agrees with Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 2, we'll put it on the screen. We looked at this on Christmas Eve, if you remember. It says, in those last days, he, God, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. And so both John and the author of Hebrews introduces to us who Jesus is, and they both agree that he's the one that made the universe. He made everything. That nothing has been made that hasn't been made by Jesus. Now, where I want us to focus, though, is verse 4. This is where I began my personal study a number of years ago. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And we say, yeah, uh, John is just uh, restating what he has said in the first three verses. That's what it looks like in our English text. But that is not at all what John is actually saying here. Really to the point, I would suggest that verse 4 should be a new paragraph. And I would, I've come to the conclusion that verse 4 should actually begin chapter 2. It's a completely different, unique thought. Verses 1 and 3 is that, yes, Jesus is the creator of the universe, of the physical universe. But verse 4 says something completely different. And when I began to understand that, it's like, wow, what, what is this? And that began my personal study for a number of years. In him was life. Now, in an English text, well, it means physical life. If I was to give you a quiz right now, now, the way I've said it, you'd be like, hmm, this is a leading question probably. I have to be careful with this. But if we took a survey, I took a survey right now, it's like, what does the word life mean? We say, well, he's been talking about that. It means the physical life. But that is not what the original recipient would have understood because they would have understood the Greek language. In him was life. It's a, it, it is a uh, Greek word, zoe, that's used, as I said, 100 and, 172 times or something like that, all the way through the New Testament. So what does this word Zoe mean? It is not an easy word to define in English. And it's taken me years to kind of come up with some kind of definition that I'm going to take a number of weeks to try to explain to you. But it's a really, really important concept to understand the scriptures in the New Testament and really what Jesus is all about. In him was life. The Greek word for this is in him. This, this would be my translation of this four word phrase in verse four. In him was quality of life, the highest quality of life. That's what John says here. In him was quality of life, the highest quality of life that you could ever imagine. And he's not talking about physical life here. It's spiritual life, but it's even beyond that. It would be if I offered you uh, ice cream from Hannaford, the, the Hannaford brand, and you'd be like, yeah, that's ice cream. But then I offered to you the highest quality of ice cream. I don't know what brand necessarily that would be, but the highest quality, with the highest quality of cream that you could put in ice cream, and you go, it's like, okay, You've tasted this Hanford brand. Now I want to give you this brand. And you go and you're like, oh my word, that's not even ice cream. That, I've never tasted anything so amazing and delicious before. And it's like, this is the highest quality of ice cream that is made. That's what, that's what the concept here is. Okay? And so this is going to be the title of our upcoming uh, sermon series. So let's put that on the screen here. 
the highest quality of life. The highest quality of life. That's what Jesus is all about. Now, John, as you know, throughout much of his letter, his book, he attaches another word to the word life. For example, in John 3.16, he adds the word eternal life. Now, again, in our English text, we think we know what the word eternal means. I did. But I was shocked to discover a number of years ago that the word eternal is not about duration. It's not the equivalent of everlasting life. That is true, but that's not the word eternal. It is about quality. So again, eternal life just re-emphasizes this highest quality of life. And so you might want to write that down. So let's go back to, to verse 4 again. In him was life, this highest quality of life that you could ever imagine. And that life, again, this highest quality of life, was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it or understood it. And I've always, since I was a young child, it's like, I don't understand that. I don't understand what, why is John now talking about light in darkness? And he does through the whole entire book. But how does it fit in? It's like, it's just what it says, but, but oh, there, there is a reason that John introduces all of this in the way that he does. So eternal life, this quality of life, John describes here as light. It's unification and fulfilled relationships and joy all wrapped together. But the contrast of that is death, darkness, broken relationships and separation and doom and gloom. And so John is introducing the word. The word shows up. Jesus appears. And he brings this new quality of life in contrast to darkness and broken relationships and separation and doom and gloom. And John says, even though the word, the light came into the darkness, the darkness did not accept it, nor did it understand this light. The darkness has not overcome it, nor understood it, verse 8. Now, let's, let's uh, go over to chapter 10, John 10. I asked you earlier this week to read these verses in John 10. But I want us to focus just on one verse, and is John 10.10. 10, this famous statement of Jesus. But in light of our study this morning and over these coming weeks... These are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life. Now, again, this word life in the Greek is not physical life because that would be ridiculous. That Jesus says, I've come that you could have physical life because you already have physical life. You say, well, maybe he's referring to spiritual life. Yes, in a sense, but again, the word life there is the Greek word zoe, the highest quality of life. So let me reread that with that understanding. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have the highest quality of life. And what he says here reinforces what I'm saying, and have it to the full or in full measure or in abundance. That is what Jesus offers to the world. He said, all the false teachers, all of your religious leaders, all they have been able to offer you is darkness. But I offer to you light. All they have offered to you is death, and I offer to you life. About separation. And God is so far off. You have nothing to do with him. 
but I'm talking about unification and the closest relationship that you could ever imagine. That is what Jesus describes in John 10, 10. Jesus invites us into a new term that I'm going to give you this morning that I don't think we've ever used before, but I think is a great term. We'll put it on the screen. Jesus invites you and me into an Abba experience. Now, I'm not talking about the musical group from the 1970s, but Abba experience. Abba means dad or daddy or papa. Not just the formal father experience, but the closeness relationship. And so Jesus invites you into a close and deep relationship with God the Father. The same relationship that he has. He invites us into that relationship. Doesn't that sound exciting? To have life and have it in full measure, in, in abundance, in, in total fulfillment. To live your wildest dream of what life could possibly be. Now here's the main thought this morning. It's going to be our um, number one point as we go along. There will be point two next time we look at this. But this is the first major point. So this, please listen carefully as we look at this. Intimacy with God. Eternal life is the intimacy with God. And so Jesus invites us into an intimate relationship, fellowship with God the Father, not just in the future, not just one day when we go to heaven. Because oftentimes when we think of eternal life, it's like, Oh, that's everlasting life. And what the Bible is talking about is someday when we go to heaven, we're going to have this intimacy with God. That's not what Jesus invites us into. He invites us into this amazing relationship with God on a daily basis right now. He says you can experience this right now to experience the same relationship that he has with the Father. Uh, let's take our Bibles again, and, and we're going to keep going to the right, and we're going to go to John chapter 17. Because if you don't believe what I'm saying, let's again look at what Jesus had to say. In John chapter 17, verse 3, in the context, this is, Jesus has spent time at the Passover table with his disciples, with his students. He's had the last supper with them. And he's gone to the Garden of Gethsemane, right outside the, the walls of Jerusalem. And remember that story? He takes Peter, James, and John, his closest friends, with him, and he said, we need to go and pray. Because Jesus was about to be betrayed and arrested and put on trial and crucified, and he says, we need to go and prepare for this, guys. And so they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a really quiet place, even still there today. Huge, huge trees. And remember the three guys, they, they fell asleep because it was getting late at night and they were physically exhausted. But Jesus goes and he gets down on his knees and John records for us this intimate conversation that he had with God the Father. Now for us, fortunately, in verse 3, the definition of eternal life is given to us by Jesus himself. And it's an incredible statement. In verse 3, it says, now this is eternal life. This is this eternal life that is just so amazing. This fulfilled life, this life that is better than anything you've ever imagined before. And he says, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, I've touched on this a number of times over the years. The word know, look at that verse again. Now, this is eternal life, that they may know you. The word know here in the Greek is not to know about God. That is not the definition of eternal life. Because there are billions of people probably today 
in the world, or certainly billions of people that have lived in the course of the last 2,000 years that have known about God, and they have known about Jesus. But that's not eternal life. The word know here is to know in personal relationship. That's what that word knows, know means. So let me go and read it in the full Amplified. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you in a personal way, that they may know you by experience, is really what the word is, that they may know you by experience, and to know Jesus the Christ in the same way. See, there's a big difference about knowing about somebody and actually knowing somebody in an intimate way. But Jesus invites us into that type of relationship with God the Father. It is a daily basis. It is something that we can experience God in this amazing way, moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, and it's now, it's not just someday in the future in heaven. Right now, we could experience this, and that is eternal life. It's amazing, this quality of life that we've only ever dreamed about. So how do we experience this highest quality of life, this fulfilled life. And how do we experience this intimacy with God? Well, fortunately, as John unfolds this thought, this concept, he gives us a summary statement at the end of chapter 3, and we'll put it on the screen here. John says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, this highest quality of life. It's that word again. For God's wrath remains on him. What I've discovered over these last few years in this personal study is that wherever this concept of life and eternal life is, is the concept of belief. It's always there. John says, this is how you experience this amazing quality of life. It's by believing in Jesus. Uh, this word, uh, believe, is to trust, to have faith in. But maybe the, the best word in the 21st century is to entrust your life. It's not just believing about Jesus, but it's actually entrusting your life to Jesus is that then you can experience this amazing quality of life. Uh, I just want to give you one little, one little more taste, one more little sampling from John. In John chapter 20, in verse 30 and 31, John 20, 30 and 31, John chooses to give the purpose statement of his writings to the very end. You would think he would give it at the beginning, but he gives it at the very end in a summary statement that is one of the most amazing statements in the Bible. John writes this, John, uh, G, excuse me, Jesus performed many other signs, many other miracles, wonders in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Now, we have not taken the time this morning to look at all of the miracles that are recorded in the book of John. But John goes and he, he says, oh, Jesus did this, and Jesus did this, and Jesus did this, Jesus did this, Jesus did this. And, and John says, I've just given you a taste. I've just given you a sample, a sampling of what Jesus did. Why? In the next verse, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe and continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, that he is God, and that by believing you may have, here's that word again, this amazing life in his name. So again, it's not talking about physical life. It is this life that is indescribable is so amazing and so wonderful.
These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that he's God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Whoever believes, whoever trusts, whoever entrusts their lives to Jesus will have this fulfilled life. And those who do not believe, who do not trust, do not entrust, will not experience this fulfilled life. Not just to experience this fulfilled life after you die and go to heaven, but to have this personal relationship with God that begins the moment that you believe and trust in Jesus, you will have this fulfilled quality of life. So today I've just given you a taste, just a sampling. You need to come back to find out more about what this amazing life is all about. But here's application. I've given you three words on the back of your program, your bulletin today, and the first one begins with B. And as you can imagine, it is the word believe. Believe. All the way through John, he said, if you want to experience this type of life, you must believe. So in order for you to experience eternal life, this personal intimate relationship with God, you must believe in the name of Jesus. John 1.12, let's put it on the screen. That's what we read at the beginning of the service. John says, yet, because he said, most people didn't believe. They were still in the darkness. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's John's way of talking about this intimacy, that God becomes our heavenly father, and we become like his children. Probably no more intimate relationship that we can think of between a child and a parent. And he said, to those who believed in his name, they were given the right to become the children of God. Number two, the word begins with W, and it's witness. Witness, to be like John the Baptist, to point people to Jesus and eternal life. Let's go back to chapter one of John. We read that at the beginning of the service. And I've never quite figured out why there was like this interlude in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, it says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. And then he goes right back to talking about the word. So he has this interlude, this little paragraph here. But it's important for us, even today, in this very moment, in this very place, that we are like John. We can go and put our name there. So there was a man sent from God whose name was Scott, or Fred, or Paul, or Gil, or Kathy, or Missy, or Don. You can put your name there. Because we are not the light, but we are the witness pointing to the light, pointing to Jesus. So let's go and, and, and reread this statement. There was a person sent from God whose name was, and we could put our name there, and this person came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. We're not that light, but we've only come to be a witness to that light. And that is the definition of what we do, that we're simply like John the Baptist. We are a witness. Part of this eternal life that I failed to mention that, uh, read that paragraph, that's very important, that sentence, is that this quality of life, and we'll come back to revisit this again in a couple of weeks, but to experience this eternal life gives us the meaning of life, the purpose of life, the direction of life. And part of that meaning and purpose and direction is simply to be that witness to say, this is the one that can give you this amazing quality of life. To, to go and everything you've ever dreamed of, it's Jesus. So we are to be a witness. And John 14, verse 6 
says, Jesus answered, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And there's that word again. Jesus says, I am that amazing quality of life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. No one can experience this intimacy with God except through me. And so we, it's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We have to point everyone to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Thirdly, the third word starts with an M, and it's the word mission. Mission. That we simply explain Jesus to people in a way that they can understand. And sometimes we really struggle with that. But John, the more I've studied the book of John, and I thought I knew the book of John so, so well, and I really didn't know it as well as I thought. But John does, he, he did this amazing job of reaching into the culture of the people that he was writing to and telling people about Jesus in a way that they could understand. And that's what we have to do today. We have to figure out the culture in which we live and the best way to tell people about Jesus that they will understand. Because with John, for the Jewish people, he, began, he, he knew it was all about theology. In the beginning, God created... He's like, I'm going to start there. For the Greeks, he started all about this impersonal force. He's like, I'm going to start there, and I can give you the name of this impersonal force. It's Jesus. He did a, a tremendous job understanding their background, and to meet them exactly where they would say, oh, give, give me a little bit more. Tell me a little bit more. Tell me a, a little bit more about this Jesus. And that's what we need to do today. We need to do that as a local church. You need to do that in your family. We need to do that as individuals. So believe, witness, mission. So this morning... I have simply offered to you just a little taste, just a small sampling, and there is much more to discover. And two weeks from today, we're going to come back and we're going to start our study. I don't know how long it's going to last, maybe a couple of weeks, but to look at what is this, what is eternal life really all about? It's not just about going to heaven someday. It's starting the moment that you believe that Jesus offers to us something, this intimacy with God, this closeness with God, this life of transformation and power, all these things we're going to look at in the coming weeks that's just, wow, what the life God has offered to us. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you that the more that we dig into your word, the more that's there. And God, thank you for this personal study that I've had over these last months and years, from time to time to come back to this, just this one word, this one concept. But Lord, how eye-opening it has been. And how amazing it has been in even to be in your presence to really understand all that you have offered and that you are offering to me and to all followers of Christ today. So God, I pray that as we continue on mission here in this community that we would find ways to be able to point people to Jesus and to explain really who he is and what he's all about. That we would be that witness that we would say, no, I'm not the one you need to look to. You need to look to Jesus. He's the one that I'm pointing to. This is the one that will give you a brand new quality of life, a whole fresh start, complete new beginning, in a way that you could never imagine. And God, I would pray for those that are maybe listening to my voice today that they have never really understood this or this may be... <laughs> This little taste and sampling is like, whoa, I, I want to know more about this and more about this guy. God, I pray that in these next little while that they would come to that place that they would believe, that they would receive you, that they would call on your name to be their savior, to be that one that would bring them into the very presence of Almighty God that they could call you their father as well. 
So God, I pray even at this moment that for anyone listening to my voice, that they would right now, that what would they need to do to acknowledge that they are a sinner, that they have fallen short of the perfect standard of God, that Jesus came to be our substitute. He took all death and darkness and separation and doom and gloom upon himself when he died on the cross. To acknowledge, to entrust our lives to him, to receive him as our Savior and Lord. To ask for this eternal life, this highest quality of new life. To be able to know God in a personal way. God, I pray that they would believe and entrust their lives. It's really that simple. You've done all the work for us. We simply need to trust in the Lord Jesus. Lord, to that end, I would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us in this hymn, a hymn that is very familiar to us. But maybe let's look at the words again for a second time in light of what we've talked about this morning. These words may take on a slightly different meaning. So let's stand, and then we'll come to the table after we sing. As we transition to our communion time, I'm going to ask Mark and Gil to come forward to join me here at the communion table. And I'm going to ask Terry to, to go to the piano at this time. Deacon Mark Conniff to ask the prayer upon the bread this morning. Father God, thank you for your amazing mercy, your amazing grace toward us. Thank you for the ultimate expression of that mercy in the sending of your perfect Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus, to die as a substitution for our sins, Lord. Jesus, we thank you for 
loving us so much that you would endure not only the physical agony of the cross, but the unimaginable separation from the Father. Lord, we can't even, we don't even understand what that means. Father, all we can do is come to you with humble and grateful hearts and accept your free gift of salvation, Lord, and the abundant life that only it provides. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to spend some extra time today around this table. And I'm going to say a couple of words. Then we're going to take of the bread, and then Terry will play on the piano for us for a moment or two. But I want us to reflect and to ponder and to remember two very important aspects of the cross of Calvary. The first aspect is what we talked about a few moments ago. Darkness. Broken in separation. Broken relationships and separation and doom and gloom and death. Because that's what Jesus faced on the cross for us. All that darkness. So remember that the scriptures record for us even there was physical darkness as Jesus was on the cross. Remember that? From 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. There was total darkness that came across the land. Just as if it was midnight. Representing the spiritual darkness. The spiritual separation and brokenness and doom and gloom that we all face. And Jesus took all of that, as Mark just prayed, all upon himself, including being separated for the first time and only time in all of eternity, separated from God the Father. Because he became our substitute. That separation, that eternal separation that we should have experienced because of our sin, Jesus took upon himself. So let's take of this cup, take of the bread, this wafer, and in the upper room that night before Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. I'm doing this for you. He says, Reflect, ponder, remember, never forget. Let's eat it together, and then I want you to think about, in your own mind, the darkness, the separation, the doom and the gloom that the world faced without Jesus. Let's eat it together.
I'm going to ask Deacon Gil Vidala to come and ask the blessing upon the cup today. Father, again we come to this table in remembrance of you. Help us to realize the agony and all that you went through. Thank you for going through the darkness in our place. But Lord, that's not the end. You gave your blood, your life for us so that we could enter with you into this uh, life that Pastor Scott was talking about, the special quality of life that you give to us. How can we thank you enough? In Jesus' name, amen. I apologize, I forgot my mic was not working, so I'll stand in front of the mic again. So as we come to the cup, again, I want us to reflect, ponder, remember. But Jesus took the final cup of that Passover meal. And it was a cup of celebration. And sometimes we think of this table as only doom and gloom. And that's part of it. But it's actually about joy as well. Because three days later, Jesus arose from the grave. He overcame death and separation and broken relationships and doom and gloom. And what Jesus wants us to celebrate today and to remember that he has brought us into life in the light and unification and a fulfilled relationship and great joy. That's what this table is also all about. So let's celebrate Jesus as we take of the cup. Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is of the new covenant of my blood, a relationship, a covenant between God and mankind signed and sealed in my own blood. Let's drink of it together. Thank you, Terry. Let me share with you some announcements, and we have some prayer requests. Over on this white table, you'll see two clipboards. The one is a sign-up sheet for the No Regrets Men's Conference that's coming up on Saturday, February 8th at the Rock Church in Bangor from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the afternoon, $10 per man. And so we need to know that information really soon so we can sign up for the tickets even this week. The second uh, sign-up sheet is for the annual meeting potluck that will be coming up on Saturday, uh, January 27th, and that will begin at 5 p.m. So we'd like to know if you are planning to attend that. Uh, this uh, week, starting tomorrow, will be my sabbatical week, so Monday through Sunday this year. Travis Pelletier will be the guest speaker next Sunday morning. And uh, the last uh, announcement that I have is a former missionary, a retired missionary, Ann Young, passed away this past Tuesday. Her uh, service will be down at Berean Baptist Church in Brunswick this coming Saturday. I may uh, attend that, and uh, I can give you more details if you'd like to know uh, more about that. Jerry Anna has an announcement about uh, Next Gen Ministry.
Hey, everybody. Matthew 18, 2 through 6. He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like a little, like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Within our church, there exists a lot of ministries, and some of those ministries are necessary for Pastor Scott to lead us on Sunday morning with the message the Lord has given him. Such teams are like the media team, the worship team, the greeters, the ushers, security team, the nursery, facilities, wonderoos, hikers, and youth. Yes, there are many other teams, but these are the ones that I'm focusing on. We meet every Sunday, so that means that every one of those teams must have the volunteers to perform the team's duties. If there aren't enough volunteers for a monthly rotation, that week isn't skipped. It just means somebody does double duty. For instance, we have three ladies in our church that volunteer both in nursery and in preschool. So that means that they sit in service twice a week and they serve twice a week. Without them, though, our other team members would have to do the same thing. Volunteering is an amazing way to show people your love for God and others. It's ministering to people like God has commanded us. I realize that sometimes you don't see a lot of children attending the church, but if we want more children, we have to make some changes. Right now, we have five ladies who are expecting babies. All of these ladies volunteer in ministries, worship, two in Wonder Roos, one in nursery, one in media, and one in students. We have made announcements. We've posted announcements in the bulletin that we need help. We don't have a children's check-in anymore because we don't have the volunteers to fill the position. We had a family with children come to us for the first time and we didn't have a children's check-in and we didn't have someone to greet them and to say, hey, welcome, and here's where our children go and here's where you go to get them. She walked through the whole church trying to find her children. And I caught up with her and I'm like, oh my goodness, let me bring you to your kids. Our middle school now, starting, they met this week, but they will be meeting every other week. So next week they will not have class, they will stay and join in here. Elementary and the Wonder Roos are also short a leader. Wonder Roos will be short a helper, and the nursery will be losing two volunteers. I don't want to offend anyone or make anyone feel guilty. That is not my goal and that is not my heart. But I do know that the Lord God Almighty is speaking to people's hearts in our congregation and asking you to step up. All I ask is that you listen. I want you to, to encourage you to seriously look at all the ministries. Find your gift, find your talent. If, try the wonderers. If it's not wor working for you, that's great. Go over to ushers. But find the talent that God has put in you to serve his mission. The, I can tell you personally from volunteering in the Next Gen Ministry that I have been blessed. The relationships that you build with these children is unexpected and their love is unconditional. And the more you get to know them, the more they learn to trust you and believe that you are another safe person that believes in God and can direct them. Watching them grow, learn about God, discover what he's done for them, they grow, and it is just a fantastic feeling to watch the light in their eyes. Helping a child be a child 
and believe in an impossible God propels them into a future that is limitless because their faith is so firmly planted in God. Don't you want to be a part of that? I want you to reach out to me if the Lord is speaking to you. Okay, thank you very much, Jerry Anna. So, very well said. Let's see. Uh, so we're going to say at this time farewell to those watching on Facebook Live and YouTube. Hope you have a great week and hope to see you soon.